what is an intervention? It's been talked about a little bit already in a couple of the presentations. I know Renee mentioned intervention in his presentation. Uh, we talked about it last year, but you have to think about what is an intervention with respect to safety? It's an action that we take to prevent injury or incident from happening at all. There's two types of risk, at-risk behaviors. There's uh, at-risk behavior that where you're, the way you act exposes you to the risk by not taking the proper precautions or uh, subjecting yourself to risk and exposure, or there's a con uh, condition that can exist that can create the problem. Both of those are situations where you need to, to intervene, okay? But why do you want to intervene in the first place? Well, you don't want to see somebody get hurt. You want to stop that situation as quickly and as safely as possible, safely being a key word there, uh, to prevent the injury or damage to any of your assets. Okay, what are we here for today with respect to intervention? What's our objective? We're gonna go through an interactive session where we want to understand why the interactive feedback session, what your personal understanding is with respect to intervention. We wanna understand why and why not you may perform an intervention in the field. We want to identify your responsibilities with respect to intervention. Would you constitute a successful intervention on your part? So we'll go through that. We're gonna compare ourselves against a survey that was done in 2010 by EHS Today. And that survey, the results of that were across 2,600 workers, uh, industries in 14 countries and 10 languages. So it was a pretty all-encompassing survey. It was done, you know, seven years ago now, so hopefully we're even in a better state than we were seven years ago. But our primary objective today is to increase the effectiveness and efficiency and frequency of our interventions that we're doing in our field today so that nobody gets hurt. You've heard me say that years and years and years from my days at IOL, so nobody gets hurt, it's our objective. So let's start with the interactive session. Real simple question. So have you ever seen an unsafe situation that decided not to intervene? Simple question, yes, no. Okay, well that's pretty close. Okay, let's see what that survey said. 73% of the people here decided not to intervene in an unsafe situation. Three quarters of the people here. How, what are your thoughts on that? Do you think that's good? Has anybody not intervened and then seen somebody get injured as a result of not intervening? So the response there of only 27% of us having done an intervention is pretty low. So it doesn't show engagement and involvement by other people. What percentage of unsafe situations do you think intervene? C is 25 to 50% as the leader, and D at less than 25%. Well, the survey that I talked about before with EHS, 39% of the situations is what they saw through their study, unsafe situations that did not get intervened. And because of that, the OSHA in the US and the HSE in the UK have strongly encouraged organizations to foster, foster what they call a positive safety culture as part of their overall safety management program. Because a low frequency of safety interventions contributes to a culture in which employees are not encouraged to work safely. I think we can all relate to that about you know, management leading by example and workers leading by example is what we have to do. And if you think about our BBS and the strong man management framework that we've got that goes along with these things, that goes a very long ways in making contributing towards a safety, a safe work environment. All right, here's, here's the reason why a lot of people won't intervene, but do you need to know the intricacies of the task before you intervene? Okay, as soon as we get around 80, we're usually pretty close. Okay, let's see what we've got. No, 78%. Can somebody tell 
why we don't need to know the intricacies of the task? Most of the time it's common sense. Most of the time it's common sense. Why would you not intervene when you see an unsafe situation? I know nothing about the task. The unsafe worker is my supervisor. I'm not trained to intervene effectively. The unsafe worker has been doing it this way for 30 years and won't change his behavior anyway. I don't want to stop the work for fear of repercussion. My previous intervention attempts have been unsuccessful or the unsafe worker would become defensive or angry. Yeah, I know, because more than one of them may apply. But what's the one that's most common and prevalent for you? Okay, this is going to be interesting, I think. Let's see what we've got, JP. The very last one. Unsafe worker would become defensive or angry. Well, the survey that I talked about, the EHS survey, the primary reason for not intervening stems from the employee's unsuccessful attempts in the past to stop and redirect safety behavior. And if you look at our results there for F, it was 9%. So it's a lot lower than what the, the survey indications were. So our biggest concern seems to be that, you know, the worker is going to be defensive and angry. And I can remember when we introduced LMRA testing within Imperial Oil as part of, our, uh, part of the program. One of the first safety forms when we introduced it, we had a session where we did a mock-up of an LMRA test. Renee, you probably remember this one, because we were concerned that the worker was going to be negative, tell you to basically bugger off, and you know, leave me alone and let me do my own job and quit telling me how to do it. The reaction we got when we got into the field and did LMRA testing was quite the opposite. The workers said, thank you for caring about my safety. So for that, what number, what's that, 41%? 41% of the people in the room who aren't intervening because they think they're going to get a negative response. Think you probably won't get a negative response. You might get somebody that says, thank you. Here's another reason for potentially not intervening, but how severe does the consequence of the unsafe act have to be before the worker, to the worker before you would intervene? Life-threatening, medical aid or up to lost time, medical aid restricted work lost time, or minor, such as a first aid, near miss, or all of the above. This one should be easy. Thank you. <laughs> so it doesn't matter the severity of the situation. If you see a potential where someone can get hurt, it's a time and a place to intervene and stop that situation and help prevent it from occurring at all. Here's an interesting spot. What's the right time to intervene in this situation? I wouldn't intervene at all, immediately, or as soon as possible without spooking the workers, or after the workers have completed their task. I'm real curious as to what this one's going to show. Because this is a real situation that we can see in our job sites where we're building C stores. Okay, 83. Let's see. Immediately, 49% immediately and followed closely behind is number C as soon as possible without spook spooking the workers. They're both valid answers. So how do you avoid in a situation like this, if you did C, what's the concern about spooking the workers? They could fall. They could fall. I'm sorry? Yeah. The last thing you want to run out and do is run up and go, hey, you stop, right? And then they go, whoa, 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 why? And then you know you've got They've slipped off the edge of the 2 by 4 or 2 by 6 or whatever it is. Um, so what you led up to there was there's a right way and a wrong way to intervene. Because you can create a situation uh, that it's a worker at more risk. I remember a personal situation with myself when I was 15 years old, which so that was even before 1974, Scott. <laughs> um, and I worked in a produce department at a Dominion store. 
and I was cutting the greens off of carrots in the back room. You know those crash doors into the back where you come through with the metal carts? Well, I was cutting the greens off carrots to reduce them on a Friday night. Somebody came through the back doors, crash doors, called out my name because they wanted me on the floor. I was in the middle of a swing and came down right on top of my hand and just about took off this finger. It was just hanging. So the same situation, if you scare the individual, can lead to the, what we were talking about here, that you could cause the incident to happen. So you have to be very careful about how you intervene, when you intervene, and immediately is often the very right answer as well, because you have, but you have to remember to do it in a way that it isn't going to have a negative result. Yes? Yeah, I'm actually surprised that we even had the 6% that said that they would pick D and wait till the very end, Rick, for exactly that reason, because you don't want to let them to continue to work in an unsafe behavior manner. Who should do interventions? The supervisor? Excuse me. The owner's rep? The safety officer? A peer? Worker from another trade? Or all of the above? or I should say any of the above, I guess. Okay, quick results on that one. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Not a lot of question there, is there? You should, shouldn't be afraid to intervene regardless of whether or not you're a co-worker with them or if you're from another trade. If you remember about going back to the situation about do you need to know the int intricacies of the task to intervene, the answer was no. So if you're an electrician, sees an unsafe situation by a carpenter up on, up on the roof, should he intervene? Yeah. He may not know the intricacies of the job, but there's nothing saying that he can't intervene and stop that unsafe situation. Would a worker perceive an intervention from a peer differently than from a supervisor? Okay, let's see what we've got. Yes, 81% said yes. Let somebody talk to me about why. Somebody that picked A, tell me why they think that's the case. So that goes back to the fear of repercussion again or whatever. Anybody else? Okay, why would it be those people that voided 19% with the doesn't make a difference who it comes from, why did they choose that one? Because you know you were in the wrong, and it, so it doesn't really matter who it comes from as long as they, you know that they're looking out for your safety, right? Okay, that's an interesting one. So how do we get past the 81%, how do we pass that obstacle, if you want to call it that, of the negative reception, if you want to call it that, if it comes from a supervisor? What do we have to do within our culture to mitigate that type of response? Can everybody hear you, Russ? Um, got the Thanks, thanks, Ron. Uh, unfortunately, what happens in a lot of cases is supervisors slash owners um, weren't going to use our already distracted driving discussion that we've had. Uh, seems to be a big one is that supervisors, owners don't follow the own rules. Um, so yes, when a worker gets admonished, they have a tendency to go, "Oh, I'm just in trouble," and what the hell, they're not doing it anyway. So, so it all it all comes back to the lead by example discussions that we've had before and Russ has got a microphone too so if there's people and Russ is going to walk around in the back if we need to get other answers but management by example lead by example and hopefully we can start to mitigate that negative response if you want to call it that of an intervention coming from a supervisor.
Should you suggest alternate, safe, safer methods of doing the job? Let the worker suggest alternates, or both of the above, as we can both learn from the situation and discussion. Let's see what we've got. 88, well, close to 100, we're getting there. But I mean, there's always an opportunity to learn. And this goes back to the intervening, and especially in a task that you're not familiar with, that you can learn something. And you may find out that, hey, what he was doing wasn't, what you thought was wrong, wasn't wrong, or wasn't unsafe. That he was, did have the proper precautions taken place. And you're, you'll learn more about how to execute that task safely yourself, as well as potentially uh, protecting against an incident from happening. Does your organization provide training on intervention? How to give and how to receive? Yes or no? Hmm. More than half said no. So is that something that we need to have addressed within our organizations? To maybe look at interventions? Do we see interventions as being something that is a positive activity to be occurring in the field? Yes? No? Yes. Ken says yes. Anybody else? I'm sorry, declining number? Right. The more, but what happens is the more you intervene, the safer the culture becomes. So it's kind of a catch-22. You, you want to get to the state that you don't necessarily have to intervene because everybody's doing it safely, but you'll get there by performing the interventions, but a bad intervention can have a negative response too. So there is a real need to be able to know how to do an intervention properly and effectively for them to be successful. Have you ever had someone intervene on you when you were conducting an unsafe act? Hmm. 54% got away with it if that, want to use that phrase. So how, do you, how, did you, how did you feel about getting away with it? When you knew you were doing something unsafe and somebody saw you and didn't intervene on your behalf, what did that, how did you feel? Nobody? Just lucky you didn't get caught? Or, geez, I better be careful the next time because I don't want them to see it again. I'm not leading by example or whatever. So it's important, pretty close tie there, actually, 54, 46, not a huge difference. But I mean, let's talk about the rationales. If yes, let's back up, you know, uh, someone intervene, yes or no. The no's were better than the yes. But if, let's go to the yes. If yes, how did you react? I thank the worker. I was embarrassed as I knew the right way to do the task, but I chose not to. I changed my work process to do the work safely. I told the intervener to mind his own business. 28% thanked the intervener, and 37% changed their work process accordingly. But we still had 21% telling him to mind his own business and carried on and did the uh, unsafe act. I think it's, uh, you gotta add those two up though. If you add the 28 and the 37, what's that, 50, 55, 65%. That's a pretty good response. Uh, you know, a positive reaction from the, the person who had the intervention done on them. And I think we need to encourage that because really all that person is doing is looking out for your safety, right? He, he's looking out for you. That's the, uh, what it says, I think it's in your hearts and minds, Daryl, about I am your, my brother's keeper or whatever that phrase shows up a lot in the hearts and minds stuff. So that's kind of what that's about. If no, why do you think no one intervened? I'm the boss. Safety is my responsibility, not somebody else's. We're all under pressure to get the job done. Concerned that I would be defensive or angry. Potential intervener does not believe themselves capable of doing an effective intervention. Wow, all over the map. <laughs> Too bad about number A, 
<laughs> That's called upward feedback. <laughs> and it should be okay. Um, pretty low on number two. High on number three to get their job pressure being key. D, concern that I would be defensive or angry, is only 13%. That goes kind of against the response we got before, doesn't it? Because it said that there, that negative response was a pretty positive one. And if you, the survey actually said that D was the most prominent one of that, you know, the 2,600 employees and the countries and the languages, number D was the biggest reason they didn't intervene, which is a negative response from workers. So hopefully we're past that, if we're down there. But D was followed closely by E, and that speaks to the need for training on how to do interventions effectively, how to give and how to receive. So an important part of intervention is how to give and how to receive, and you only get that capability through practice. So if you haven't done an intervention, try one, because I'm sure every one of you will see an opportunity out there to be able to do an intervention on an unsafe act. I know I have when I've been out in the field. Do you believe it is part of your job to intervene in an unsafe situation? Well, I was hoping for 100%. But 91 is pretty good. But in it, the intervention is a part of everybody's job responsibility, the ability to intervene and do it. Because that's the way we want our job sites to be. If I go back to the comment that was made here earlier, the more frequently we intervene, the better the culture becomes, and the lower the frequency required to do an intervention in an unsafe act because they're being reduced, because people are paying more attention to their job. So, in conclusion, effective interventions can prevent injury. Be respectful and don't lecture. That's the big part. We can't lecture because it, nobody likes to be being told what to do. Everybody will react negatively to being told what to do. How many people would agree with that? A lot of hands going up. Show concern for the well-being of the worker. So you approach them and say, hey, you may talk about something separately first, but then you move to the fact that you're concerned about the way they're doing this because you don't want to see them getting hurt or whatever. You don't call them a stupid idiot or whatever. You actually start to work with them and show that you've got a genuine concern for their safety. Try to understand the reasons behind the worker's unsafe behavior. Don't assume he was just being lazy or had poor motivation or didn't know how to do the job in the first place. So understand. I highly recommend that your companies here incorporate intervention training with your staff. I can't remember the exact numbers, but there was an awful high percentage of companies here that have no intervention training as part of their safety program. It's something I think you should look at because if it's done effectively, it will improve your safety record. A culture of caring for your coworkers will lead to more effective and more frequent interventions, which if we carry that forward, will reduce the number of unsafe acts and the need to do interventions in the first place. <laughs>